Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the webinar. Happy New Year to you. Hope you had a good break. Um, we're back in 2022. And this gentleman wants to say Happy New Year to you. This will work you up. Jeff Bezos <laughs> with his now girlfriend, uh, Lauren Sanchez, who's 52, it turns out. Happy New Year from, from Jeff, um, $200 billion. Um, maybe does buy you love. So that was a cheery start to 2022. Um, but let's see what markets have been doing, which is really what we're here to talk about. Last year, it's quite an interesting chart. Top performing main asset class was crypto. We just talked about that a lot last year. Bitcoin up 60% in 2021. Um, and then really anything to do with reflation and inflation. So oil up 60%, um, give or take 56%. Commodities up 37%, real estate up 35%. These are all inflation plays. S&P was up 27%. Uh, in South Africa, we were up about the same. So um, that was good. Gold down 3%. So Bitcoin was really where you needed to be uh, last year. And you really needed to be in the right one. So look at this. These are the winners. Ethereum, we talked about Ethereum a lot last year, up 400%. Interesting. Now we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, Lucid, which is a Tesla competitor, up 280%. So anything very techy, you know, very cutting edge. Uh, Nvidia up 125 percent. That's a, that's a metaverse play. At the bottom, Evergrande Group. You can just about see on the left, down 90 percent. That's the Chinese property play. And then Peloton, um, which was a COVID play. You know, everyone's cycling at home. Um, Peloton peaked and then has fallen 76 percent. It's fallen more since then. So uh, those uh, kind of um, COVID plays, stay-at-home plays, kind of reversed. So a very mixed bag, you're going to be in the right things, as usual. And um, one of the right things was NFTs. Again, we talked about that. NFTs, um, non-fungible tokens, um, absolute digital ownership, uh, went a berserk. Um, and people started buying these JPEGs, in effect. which They were JPEGs, which you actually own. Um, and this NFT of the mutant ape. Um, as just one small example, sold for 200 Ether on OpenSea, which is the main NFT platform. 200 Ether is 11 million Rand. So that's fairly incredible. So these were kind of normal prices last year and into this year. That's continued. So blockchain, crypto, NFTs, metaverse exploding. But we did have some kind of some warning signs uh, coming into this year. This is an interesting chart. Um, ARK, which is Kathy Wood's um, exchange-traded fund, which is a cutting-edge technology fund you've probably heard about, went crazy popular and went up a lot in price. These are the um, directors buy, buys and sells with, buy, buy companies within that fund. So companies which Kathy Wood's got an investment in, like Peloton, um, what were the directors doing? Were they buying or selling? So the red is purchases and the blue is sales. So these insiders, the directors, weren't selling at all until really a lot of part of, of last year and then into this year. And, they, and then they sold like crazy. So they dumped about $100 billion of stock um, towards the end of last year. That was a clearly a warning sign. And these things have been kind of coming back quite a lot already. So you had the big technology stocks still doing well, crypto still doing okay. But at least spec tech, speculative tech things uh, were coming down. Just cast your eye down this, for example. Peloton, we talked about it, one, two, three, fifth down. Peloton was up 400% in two, 2020. And in 2021, last year, it fell by 76%. We saw that already. Zoom, a little bit further down, was up 400% in 2020, down 45% in 2021. And you can see a lot of these spec things were, were coming back a lot towards the end of last year. And that's continued into this year. We've talked about this tech bubble bursting um, and the market being expensive. It's starting to happen. So we got used to screens like, like this one in 2022, which was, I can only describe as a tech route. This is what we call a heat map of the market. Uh, the, the, the bigger the company, the bigger the block, and then red or green, red is down, green is up. This is a typical day in 2022. Microsoft down 2%, Google down 2%, Facebook down 3.75%. Facebook fell, of course, by 20% last night, overnight. Um, so this tech unwinding, the froth is starting to really come out of, of that part of the market now. So year to date this year, 
uh, a, a very different uh, view really to uh, last year. And yes, I will send the slides to you. Thank you. Um, gold up 1%. People going to kind of safe havens as the market kind of unwinds. I'll explain why it's unwinding in a second. S&P down 8%. It bounced a little bit, but it's still down whatever it is, 6% right now. NASDAQ, the tech index down 13%. It was down 20% at one point. Bitcoin is off 20%. So a very different shape to markets. Again, the market's been running strongly. They've been starting to lose their froth, and they're really coming down um, with a vengeance now. To the extent that this is, this is an interesting chart. So Berkshire Hathaway, the famous Warren Buffett, a you know, real value kind of fund or company in blue. Um, so value investing in blue, cheap industrial companies. In red is, is the Cathie Wood Arc Innovation ETF. So went to the moon in 2020, 2021, and then towards the end of 21, started coming down, 2022 collapsed. So over that period, tech boom, value stocks are now caught up. Quite amazing. We'd expect that to continue to, to happen as a trend. And crypto, as I mentioned, has not been immune. Um, this is just a screenshot I took, um, I think, early in 2022. Ethereum is down 20% on the day. Bitcoin is down 15% on the day. So we've been talking about looking for a shakeout in tech, therefore a shakeout in crypto, to maybe get involved in crypto more. Uh, and we're see seeing it now. I don't think it's done, but there will be a time to get involved in Ethereum um, and other more speculative assets. And I thought this is quite amusing. Um, Dogecoin, which is the, the joke uh, crypto, um, which has been backed by Elon Musk famously last year, went to the moon <laughs> in May. Uh, you can see it went to 90, and it's now back to 17. And Dogecoin is showing strong support at zero, which is quite amusing, you might thought. We'll probably go back to zero because it is essentially worthless. So what's causing this? Okay, we've been talking about inflation being a problem, interest rates going up. As interest rates go up, the market comes down, particularly growth shares, which are long-dated. So they need low interest rates to discount back at a low interest rate for a high net present value. So higher interest rates really undermine growth companies, they undermine tech companies. Value companies are a little bit better as rates go up. Inflation is coming through. Global supply chain pressure, you can see here, extensive. And also what you're seeing, of course, in the headline rate of inflation is very high rates of inflation. This is the, uh, I think this must be the US rate. So the US inflation is running at 7% per annum. Fed funds rate is still zero, <laughs> by the way. Inflation is seven. Now it'll come down from seven, but it'll probably settle about three or four. That's too high when rates are not. So rates are going to go up a lot. So that's what we're heading into now. We're, we're just at the start of the unwind. And in certain parts, and, and you will know this, inflation has been crazy in a lot of our lives, particularly in, in food uh, and basics, basic needs of life. Um, this is our breakfast. <laughs> this is the Financial Times breakfast indicator. Oats, coffee, orange juice, wheat, and milk. January 2020 at the start, it's gone up since in those last two years. That cost of breakfast is up, what is that, 60%. That's what, that's what people will be feeling. And this is becoming a real problem. The Fed is getting well behind the curve. It needs to raise interest rates, which it's finally starting to do, but it needs to move much faster. Okay, COVID, uh, this is a quote from Michael Jordan, um, ex-CEO of f &B, obviously. COVID brought the world free money. COVID brought the world free money. So zero interest rates and money printing. Both are ending. I thought this summed it up very well. So COVID, um, the world, you're welcome. Uh, we exported Omicron, which is bringing an end, I think, to COVID. Maybe too early to say that, but I think it is bringing an end to it because it's much less virulent and doesn't kill people very often. Um, and you can see, um, or certainly not in any great numbers, I should say. You can see this in terms of, this is a London chart, but this would be true globally. Number of cases, very, very high. Number of patients, high. Ventilators, low, hardly moved. Deaths, low, hardly moved. So very different to the previous peak you can see in 2021, where they all went up together. So this is unwinding now. It's becoming an endemic, not a pandemic. It'll be something we'll just have to get used to. So COVID coming to an end and free money come to an end, therefore higher interest rates. And higher interest rates are a problem when you've got a market which is 
valued like this. So this is the price earnings ratio, the Schiller price earnings ratio. It's called the Cape Schiller price earnings ratio. And that what, what the Schiller price earnings ratio does, it takes normalized earnings. So it takes like a, I think it's a, yeah, it's a 10 year um, average of your earnings, previous 10 years. So to iron out peaks and troughs, takes that average and takes the price. So price to a normalized earnings rate. So it's a much slower moving, kind of more reliable kind of P ratio. And you can see how that peaked um, in 1999, 2000 in the dot-com bubble. And it's also peaked recently at 40-ish times. So that's not pretty. Market is still expensive. And if you take this ARC ETF I've been talking about, again, this is a high innovation tech ETF, become the kind of poster child of the tech boom. That's in red on this chart, the ARC ETF, that's the price. And then the kind of bluish line is the NASDAQ back in the tech bubble and tech bust in 1999-2000. So the blue line goes up a lot, it comes down a lot. The ARC ETF goes up a lot, it's now coming down. So it's halved from its peak, it's probably going to halve again. So this tech shakeout, this, this, this shakeout in the market is not over as yet. Fortunately, in South Africa, um, markets are, are, are not like that at all. They're, they're actually quite cheap and have been cheap for a little while, which is why we, we, we add our mutual favor South Africa over global assets. So you can see the S&P 500, 23 and a half times in green. Emerging markets on 14 times, also very cheap. And South Africa within that 12 times. So uh, we've been saying this for a little while. Investing domestically is a smart thing to do now compared to putting money offshore. It will be for a little while, I suspect. Okay, enough on markets. That's where we are. We'll watch those unfold. I mean, it will be very volatile, by the way. Um, but we are getting the shakeout will give opportunities. I will say that as well, particularly in crypto. We're not launching crypto fund yet, uh, but we will be launching our applied intelligence fund, the AI fund, hopefully to coincide with kind of the bottom of the shakeout, which will be about the middle of this year, where we can invest in crypto and blockchain and all these exciting technologies after they've all sold off. So middle of the year, look after the AI fund. That'll be the opportunity, I think, uh, which I will run. All right, technology quickly. I want to get on to collapse of civilization, that cheery topic. Okay, a new text was space plane vision halfway around the world in 40 minutes. We better get used to that. That'll be coming pretty soon, I suspect. So we'll all be jetting around the world quite happily. Elon Musk, um, keep an eye on this. He's going to keep on making cars, obviously, but he's also going to be making robots. So expect a very user-friendly robot soon um, from Elon Musk um, coming to our homes and probably industrial releases, obviously, first. And finally, I thought this is actually very interesting. Uh, the new Tesla Roadster. This is the kind of progress which Elon Musk has made in electric vehicles. It's really extraordinary. I mean, the Bugatti Chiron, the fastest car in the world, $3 million. Tesla Roadster, $200,000. Nord 60, let me look at that. It's faster, quarter mile faster, almost fast top end. The range, look at that, 620 miles for an electric vehicle. That is amazing. It used to be a problem. It's not a problem anymore. And you can also see four people. Well done, Elon Musk. Remarkable. All righty. Let's get on, I think, to the collapse of Western civilization. We're going to talk about this for about 20 minutes, maybe 25. There's a lot to get through. Okay. This is the kind of quote which gives the, the core premise for why I think we're in a bit of trouble here. This is a long-term structural view. I'm going to read it out. Uh, the chap here used to be my boss. He is the uh, it is Sheikh Mohammed Bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai. When I worked in Dubai, he was my uh, boss because I ran the Sovereign Wealth Fund. His father said, the founder of Dubai, Sheikh Rashid, was asked about the future of his country. And he replied, my grandfather rode a camel. My father rode a camel. I ride a Mercedes. My son, my boss, rides a Land Rover, which he does. And my grandson is going to land a, ride a Land Rover. But my great grandson is going to have to ride a camel again. And why is that, he's asked. His reply was, hard times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. And weak men create difficult times. Genius. Many will not understand it, but you have to raise warriors, not parasites. We're in the stage of Western civilization where, civilization where we have weak men creating difficult times. Things are too easy. It's an age of decadence. It's an age of leisure. And we're starting to rot from within. We're becoming uncompetitive. And the East is coming. 
So there's lots of, of, of premises of, for why an empire or a civilization corrodes from within. It's like the Roman Empire. I'll come back onto that and we'll run through them. The first is we're working less. Annual working hours per worker. This is over the last 100 years or so, and it's basically half in the West. We're working half the working hours we used to do. Our home time has become much easier because we've got refrigerators, um, vacuum cleaners, freezers, dryers, what are those, microwaves, dishwashers. Everyone's got them now. Well, not, not everyone, but you're probably everyone in America's got them. Which means that your, your, your housework, your hard work at home, has gone from 60 hours a week to 15. So less hard work. More leisure time. More leisure time. And more leisure time. Look at that. So many choices. So little time. Everyone's got leisure time. We don't realize these things, but they creep up on us. More leisure time. What are we doing with the leisure time? Mm. We're watching telly. That's not great. It's not very really productive. It's certainly not hard work. We're watching telly. And we're watching the internet. Time per day spent using the internet. Look at this. Oh my God. It's unbelievable. <laughs> okay, worldwide. Look at this. The average time per day spent using the internet in 2019, this will only have gone up. Average hours per day is six hours, 42 minutes. This includes work, I'm sure. <laughs> But we're awake for 12 hours a day, probably 14 hours a day. That's our waking time, our wake time. And we're spending half it on the internet looking at screens. And again, it'll be more today, post-COVID, that's for sure. South Africa, we're at 8 hours and 25 minutes a day. Oh, my God. Philippines, that are barely, barely believable, 10 hours. They're playing too much Axie, Infin Axie Infinity gaming on the metaverse. Japan's the only sane country in the world where they got 3 hours, 45 minutes on the far right. So yeah, we're doing too much of this stuff. <laughs> Not productive quite a lot of the time. And look at this. The surprising benefits of video games for kids. Fantastic. Really? Yeah, that's not productive hard work. We're molly coddling kids and they're gonna suffer as a result, I'm sorry to say. So we're working a lot less, particularly in the West. This map shows it. And the lighter the color, the less working hours. The darker the color, the more working hours. Look in China, look in Indonesia, look in Vietnam, look in India, they're still working hard. Look in the West, nah, not so much. And we kind of say we're more productive. And in the West, uh, we use more machinery. We use more technology, therefore we are more productive. So you can work fewer hours. Okay, this chart shows it. Labor productivity on the bottom. As you turn to the right on the x-axis, that's more productive. And the annual working hours on the y-axis, so the lower, the, the fewer hours. So on the bottom right, few hours, very productive. Germany, Norway, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Europe. Okay, get it. Towards the left, lower labor productivity, higher working hours, China, Pakistan. Okay, that's a, that's a premise. However, our productivity has collapsed. Five-year average growth in worker productivity, Japan, France, Germany, Italy, UK, US. Gone from 4% per annum to zero. That's a problem. So that premise about uh, more productive, less work, justified, going away. And look at this, change in working hours. <laughs> this is fascinating when I found this. All right. This is over the last 50 years, okay? And we saw the working hours come down. And let's look at the countries over that period. Australia, 21% fewer working hours. 21%. Belgium, 27%. Canada, down 23%. China, up 10%. <laughs> Germany, down 44%. India, up 2%. Norway, down 33%. Portugal, all the European countries. Russia, up 2%. South Africa, not so bad. We're still working okay. Down 7%. It's fascinating, isn't it? Switzerland, down 24%. So the, west, the east, working, west, down. Problem. And look, we're about to compound it. <laughs> we're about to go to a four-day week. Um, which way are we going to go? A four-day week, five-day week? Probably a four-day week. It's already happening in the UK. And look at this survey. 80% of senior managers under the age of 35 like the thought of adopting a four-day week. These are the senior managers. 
compared with 50%, 56% of those aged 55 or older. So the older generation, not so keen. Younger guys and girls, very keen. These are senior managers, not the workers. Oh, we're good at 40 a week, make life a bit easier. Going the wrong way. They're not doing this in China. <laughs> they're, earning, they're working six day weeks. So that's the first premise of the undermining the civilization. Less work, more leisure time, more decadence. Second one is more inequality. I couldn't believe this chart. Okay, this is the percentage change in real income since 1948. For the bottom 90%, that's us, <laughs> um, in the last 50 years, our real incomes have been flat. This is a global stat, flat. The top 10% real incomes have doubled. So your inequality quotient has exploded in the West. Big problems, social unrest, populism, all those things which again undermine the social fabric of a civilization. I'll come back onto that one. So let's talk the other side. That's the social rot. Let's talk what, 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 the, what the oppo is doing, what our opposition is doing, our new masters. China, Russia, and Iran. Russia and China's plans for new world order. This is a geopolitical thing. What are they doing whilst we're working less? Well, geopolitically, they're making strides. We've talked about this quite a lot last year in terms of what China is doing. Let's recap. Disputed claims in the South China Sea. China is expanding and is controlling de facto the South China Sea. Okay? This is one of the great trading hubs, the great, the great sea routes of the fast-growing part of the world which is Southeast Asia. It used to be controlled by America. No longer. China now de facto controls it, I would say. And um, the Fiery Reef or Fiery Reef, not quite sure how it's pronounced. This is January 2006. It's just like a coral island, an atoll. Today, this is what the Chinese have done to it. <laughs> this sits right in the center of the South China Sea. It, it's an incredibly important strategic position. And they have created a military base. Let me just show you that again. That's what it used to be. It's just a coral reef. This is what they created. So this is the kind of thing they're doing. And the other thing China are doing is, I've shown these charts before, their navy and their air force is now bigger than America's um, in this region. So they dominate. And they're flexing their muscles. We talked about this. Taiwan will be the next to go. China sees Taiwan, which is an independent state, island state, by the way. China sees Taiwan as, as a province of China. That's in its constitution. And it's flying jets over there just to worry the Taiwanese more and more and more. And at some point, they'll probably invade. Hong Kong already has been subsumed into China. We talked about that. Um, the government is now run by Chinese officials. Democracy is dead in, China, in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has been subsumed, and the West did absolutely nothing. And China has uh, both conventional strike missiles and nuclear ballistic missiles, which can um, uh, land 13,000 kilometers away, which encompasses the entirety of America and Canada, and Europe, by the way. So the nuclear capability is um, world dominant. And I talked about the, the, um, the space velocity vehicles, we, but they're now circling the world which can fire nuclear missiles anywhere as well. That was a previous webinar I did at the end of last year. So China is dominant militar militarily as well. And we used to think China wouldn't kind of do anything because they held a lot of US debt. And why would they scupper the US? Because you know they're gonna shoot themselves in the foot. Well, they've dealt that as well because they've been selling. So they've not, still got a trillion, but compared to their war chest, doesn't really matter. That's come down. And as a percentage of total US debt, it's halved. So economically, they're reducing their ties to America as well. And as we know, <clears throat> the Belt and Road Initiative, I've been talking for quite a long time, the new Silk Road and Silk Maritime routes through into Africa, through the Middle East, into Europe, into Rotterdam. This is happening. It's an $8 trillion project, um, and, and, and it's based on debt provision, which then gets swapped into equity when the developing countries can't pay it back. We know the story. This is the, <clears throat> this is the shape of the new empire. This is the new empire, empire party by stealth. <clears throat> so you've got the military expansion and the economic expansion. And let's not forget Russia. Russia is on the Ukrainian border as we speak with 100,000 troops. Um, 
and they are ready to go. Um, this is a map which shows you where Ukraine is. And crime, if you look at this, um, at the, at the, in the south of Ukraine is Crimea, and that was taken by Russia, it was annexed by Russia in 2014. And the West, the West put sanctions in place, you know, who cares? Um, they just took Crimea. And they will probably invade southern Ukraine, probably not western and northern Ukraine, but it's probably a southern Ukraine, limited invasion which is the bit they want to control. They want to landlock Ukraine. So they'll con con control that Black Sea route in, the, in southern Ukraine. That's what they really want geopolitically in terms of its access into the Middle East and the Mediterranean. So um, that will probably happen. And Biden's already suggested that the West kind of wouldn't do anything if it was a limited invasion. This is China and Russia flexing their geopolitical and military muscles. It's not a coincidence that they're doing this. And Russia's been getting its act together. Okay, Russia, the Russian economy is actually only the size of Italy's. It's actually a pretty small economy, but it has got its act together. Oil price is high, really good for it. Its debt to GDP has been brought down to not much at all, 10, 15, 20%. The United States debt to GDP, affordability of war, through the roof. Debt to GDP through the roof, affordability of war through the floor. The US can't afford these, these offshore conflicts anymore. Another uh, factor in um, a decline of civilization, the reluctance to engage offshore, partly because you can't afford it. And as I said, let's not forget Iran. This interesting photo is Russian, Chinese, and Iranian warships in the Indian Ocean on a drill last year. I didn't actually know they did this. Russia, China, and Iran together on military exercises. And Iran is about to get the bomb, the nuclear bomb that is, I mean, they've had the, the to and fro with the West in terms of, of deals and potential sanctions and will they, won't they? And they, they're well, right now, I, I'd be amazed if they haven't got it already. So welcome to your nuclear arsenal, Supreme Leader in Iran. That will be an interesting move for the Middle East geopolitical situation at a time when <clears throat> the US has just removed itself from the Middle East. This is the, the chaotic, shambolic, shameful exit from Kabul in Afghanistan. And the Taliban moved in within an hour. And that was the US out of the Middle East. So Iran is flexing, will be flexing its muscles in the Middle East. China is already moving into the Middle East. It's upped its investment into Iraq and Iran to, I think, $10.6 billion last year from $6 billion the year before. And it is helping develop schools and infrastructure and oil fields. China's money is pouring into the Middle East as the US is coming out. So nearly there. So this is kind of a map which shows you kind of American stroke Western, American influence globally. And um, their control of the oceans, where they have geopolitical hegemony, so in a sense a complete alliance, and then a sphere of influence in the kind of pink. So if you play out the narrative I just said, North Pacific Ocean and, and the, the South China Sea, gone. Indian Ocean going, Middle East, gone. Um, Europe, Trump would pay to that in terms of the political alliance, I suspect. So US, big retreat. So geopolitically, this is happening. You've got this retreat of America. You've got social corrosion internally. You've got inequality. You've got a lot of parallels with Rome. And the peak of the Roman Empire was this. And this was in AD 117. And at that time, Rome was the largest empire in the world. It was basically a Mediterranean empire. It got to the East eventually, kind of stayed there a bit longer. But in effect, this was its peak. <clears throat> in 117. And at that point, the signs also were in Rome. I'll come back to them in a second. Social corrosion, inability to engage in offshore or far Mediterranean countries in Rome, couldn't defend its, its turf as effectively. And it also had a common enemy, as we do now, which is China, Russia, Iran. And for Rome, it was the now Germany. It was the German barbarians, which kept on invading into the north. And they just couldn't repel it in the end because they didn't have the wherewithal, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the, the, the social fabric to do it, the will to do it. And so my final slide is just comparing Rome then, peak, 
with America stroke west now at peak. And this will be my last slide, and it's worth spending a, a touch of time on this. And then I'll try and get to some questions. I'll come back after that one in a second. All right, factors that define, define the peak of empire. I give this a little bit of thought. Rome, United States. Declining economic strength. I want my next webinar to probably be an examination of what the Federal Reserve has done in America to ruin America by printing money. Declining economic strength. They are destroying Western civilization through a Federal Reserve Ponzi scheme. That might be an interesting discussion. So we've done social, we've done geopolitics, I might do finance next time. Declining economic strength, I think that's, that's pretty clear. Rome had the same thing. Reluctance to engage overseas because the tax take goes down, your debt has gone up, so you can't afford it, and you kind of lost the will to do it. In America, they kind of just don't want to do it anymore. It's too painful. So you get declining geopolitical reach and influence. US withdrawing from Asia. China, by the way, has just set up its new um, Pan-Asia trading hub. It signed it last week. America is not part of that Pan-Asia trading hub. First time ever. It's quite remarkable. China controls that Asian trading hub now because US geopolitical reach has got nowhere near it. High inequality. This is fascinating. I was trying to find how unequal Rome was at its peak because you have that views of decadence and grapes and wine and senators and and decay and, and, and more decadence. And so it was the case. The Gini coefficient, turns out, in Rome at that peak was 0.43. Really bad, which is as bad as America now, 0.42. Exactly the same. Isn't that remarkable? I would say uh, South Africa is 0.65, worse than the world. Again, shameful. This is bad. In Rome, the top 1% of the population by wealth owned 16% of the wealth. Very high. America today is 32%. So again, very high. Huge inequality and unfairness in terms of what the top are getting. Therefore, rising populism. Thank you, Trump. Trump just tapped into what was already happening. Populism was rife in America. He just tapped into it. That's his genius. And, and stoked it. So this polarization across social media, there's people shouting at each other the whole thing, populism pandering to the crowd. Same in Rome, that's why I showed the Colosseum. Get back onto that, same here. Excess leisure time, I've done that at length. Hopefully I've convinced you we've got too much leisure time, we're not working hard enough. And then a voice to what people call the mob. In Rome, that was the Colosseum. And in the Colosseum, it, 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 it was baying for blood gladiators to be killed, shouting at each other, political divide. And today is the modern, our, our equivalent of the Colosseum is Twitter, yelling at each other, baying for blood, violent, nasty to each other. We've given a voice to, dare I say, the mob. And it's ugly. The wealthy move to the fringes. I checked this. And um, what happens when things start to decay? People kind of worry about it. The very wealthy move outside of the cities. They move to the coast. Um, and if you take the uh, billionaires, and I wrote this down, I'll try and find it. The, the billionaire list. All right, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos live in Medina in Washington state. Richard Branson lives in Necker Island. Elon Musk lives in South Texas. Warren Buffett lives in Idaho, obviously, never, never moved. Larry Page and Sergey Brin are, I think, in Fiji and New Zealand. They certainly have residences in New Zealand. Mark Zuckerberg lives near, near his office. He's quite young in Palo Alto. Steve Ballmer lives in Washington State. Um, and Larry Ellison lives in Hawaii. That's your top 10. It's happening. Happened in Rome too. They all went to the coast and built huge, vill built huge villas. Declining tax take from the wealthy. Okay, today it's asset owners because your capital gains tax is like 18%. Your income tax, which the majority of people pay, is 40%. Okay? So asset owners, the wealthy, who already own equities and assets and things, pay much less tax than the normal person, actually. Technology multinationals, they all channel through Ireland. They pay very low tax to the government, so the government is weaker. They can't engage overseas. Private equity leaves very low rates of tax. In Rome, it was the senators, who were the wealthiest of the wealthy, and they hardly paid any tax. Everyone else paid the tax into the senators. 
So this unfairness at the top is a common factor. And then reduced competitive drive. Um, it's kind of ebbing. Maybe we don't feel it. Maybe we're all working hard. I work quite hard. I'm sure we all work quite hard. But actually, as a, as a population, we're not working hard enough. And the East is working really hard and are very, very competitive. We lost our competitive drive. So my closer really is, are we suffering from status quo bias? Status quo bias is um, a comfort blanket. It's, you can't envisage a world other than your normal world because it, it's kind of too scary and too difficult to think about, which is why people kind of sleepwalk into bankruptcy and into decline. And R Rome didn't see its decline coming at the time. He would have a wonderful time drinking wine and eating grapes and having a wonderful time. Um, they didn't see it coming. I think we're not seeing it coming. But the rot has set in and it's multifaceted and it'll take a while, but the signs are undoubtedly there. All right, thank you. Let me take some, a lot of questions. Uh, let me just see. Okay, comment on China's influence and infiltration into Africa. Interesting. Um, could I comment on China's influence in Africa? Well, China's influence in Africa is fairly profound, and I'm going to sh actually show it to you. I was going to try and show it to you. Oh, there it is. All right, can you still see my slides? I had a China slide in my back pocket for Africa. I'm going to show it to you. I'll go fairly easily through this. There it is. All right, interesting. This is a map which shows you red is China, red is China imports basically. So 2000, 2019, how much of your imports were, were from China? How much of your country's imports came from China? And in our 20 year period, it's gone from basically not much from China to basically everything from China. So yes, <laughs> China, um, this, this, this piece, the economic empire by stealth, is working, particularly in Africa. You saw the Belt and Road Initiative go straight through it, and we see Chinese people are in business everywhere, in infrastructure and in our business, and they are becoming very dominant. Okay. Um, Rome, coins were debased, and the US is printing money. Brilliant observation. Brilliant observation. You're absolutely right. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. Coins were debased in Rome, equivalent of US printing money. So each coin becomes worth less. Each dollar becomes worth less. Very clever comment. Um, I'll be covering now that and the financial angle of what the Fed's been doing to America through its money printing, I think, in the next webinar. I think that's probably what I'll do to kind of round out the case. Okay. So I think I will just stop there. So I hope that didn't kind of depress anyone. It's going to take a while, so enjoy it while you can. But the East is going to win, the West is going to lose, and we're our own worst enemy, and unfortunately, we can't see it coming. And in the meantime, keep an eye for markets. We may get a short-term bounce in tech and things, which we're kind of seeing, but I think the tech is, is unwinding now. It's like the NASDAQ bubble unwinding, which took a little while, but it is unwinding. And I'm hoping for a kind of a market bottom in that area, kind of the middle of the year, when we can start buying into those interesting trends for our clients. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to get a lot of volatility and probably quite a lot of market weakness. All right. Lovely to see you and uh, see you next time.